This is Grayson Caps. You're watching THTV. Today, I'm like, should I ask him? You know, it is election season. Nah, let's not go into that. But uh, I say one thing about it I'm self employed, middle class, so I don't care who. There you go. <laughs> you know what? And that, that takes care of our first question. <laughs> Second question How did you enjoy Seaside today? I loved it because um, I grew up playing on porches. Mm -hmm. That's kind of what we were doing. Yeah. <laughs> I noticed it looked like something out of what I would ex like your album covers, you know, sitting on the porch, yeah. beer strewn everywhere. And I'm like, it's like he took some of his life and plunked it right down here on Seaside, which was really cool. But uh, is this your first time playing in any of the towns along 38th? I've really? played in Destin before uh -huh. at uh, the Funky Blues show. Okay. And uh, uh, we'll probably come back there because that guy's been real nice to us. Uh -huh. And that's been the band. And then uh, my friend uh, Van Pratt from Strickland just moved here from uh, Columbus, Georgia. Okay. So he's playing a little house concert for the first time in. Is it Seaside or Santa Rosa Beach? I don't know. Well, I mean, it depends on who you <laughs> ask. Because technically we are in Santa Rosa Beach, but all the, all the little communities along this stretch of highway like to have their own town names. Yeah. So. Here we are in Seaside. Yeah, we're by the, yeah we're very, very much Seaside. So yeah, sorry. pretty unique place. But uh, you've been touring all over the country the past year. How have the shows been in other parts of the country outside of the South? It's been really great. Um, you know, it's been a slow burn since I think the first thing I've done solo was started yeah, no, in 2005. <laughs> and between the movie, you love song for Bobby Long, and did some songs for Straw Dogs, which came out a year and a half ago. Uh -huh. I'm able to show up in places, and you know, for example, we played Evansville, Indiana, and uh, this guy with a little bar had forced fed you know all my CDs. <laughs> so we show up in this bar. If you've never been. There's 200 people there. Uh -huh. No words to the songs. And it's like. Wow, you know, we're up in Wyoming, people no words and songs, so that was pretty cool. Yeah, good reception. And, uh, you know, it's, I've gotten to the point in my career where I can almost go anywhere in the world and get at least 15 people to show up. That's good. I mean, really, you know, that feels good to me. You know? oh, 15 awesome. will turn into 30. <laughs> well, I mean, speaking of shows outside of the South, you said all over the world. You've even played in Europe and recorded a live album, the Live at the Paradiso in Amsterdam. What was, how was your music received in that part of the world? And you know, did the Europeans relate to song or like the good old South that you sing about? Very much so, where they speak English, like uh, Holland, Germany, England, of course. Um, once you get into France and. Italy, um, I, I have a guy that I play with named Jason Tony who, when I tell stories in between songs, he'll translate them. So, because okay. Italian is not so much readily, you know, say, eat cornbread, raise hell, you know. It's, you know, you can say that in Holland. I don't understand. Like You're yeah, right, right. So, um, Holland, Norway, Sweden. The stories seem to uh, be um, identifiable. Uh -huh. I don't know the stories that happened there, so it, it, it's been a great connection. Yeah. There's always these people who are these charming, intellectual alcoholics mm -hmm. who will baffle you with how ludicrous they are, but how dead on they can be with the truth. Uh -huh. So the truth, you know, people say, hey, and it's, it's easy to play in, in Europe, right? They love Southern music. I'm like, no, they want the truth, no matter what. And so it boils down to just being truthful. Uh -huh. Well, 
It's been about two years since you disbanded the Stump Knockers and put together the Lost Cause Minstrel. Since then, have you had to change your approach to writing and playing music at all? No, because this band actually accommodates the recordings that I've actually done. Whereas the Stump Knockers were this group that started at El Matador in New Orleans. And, and uh, like a friend of mine said, whoever you were sleeping with on August 29th, 2005, you're married to now, because the hurricane. Yeah. And that was my band I had, and nobody's got a job. And we hit the road for like two years. And um, it had its crazy thing, but it was, it was a real little feral, you know? <laughs> We gained a lot of fans and lost a lot of fans. You know, people being like, oh, Tommy just like, hey, bah, 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 bah. you know, it's like this kind of stuff. You know, yeah. I've kind of gotten to the point where I'm like, I'm understanding children and grandmas. And so the whole wishing your rock star things over with, it's yeah. just like, you know, here's the song, the best I can do. Uh -huh. I don't know if that answers the question. Good enough. You know, speaking of grandmas, my mom's actually. Yeah, I know. You don't want to put, I'm, you know, it's like, and then there's going to be kids. Listen to it. We got kids. Oh, yeah. It's like, wow. And that's where the beauty of blues music comes in. It's like, don't mess with my jelly roll. Now, a kid can identify with it, and an adult can identify with yeah, right. it. <laughs> no harm done. Yeah. Well. Speaking of the Lost Cause Minstrels, this was also the name of your last record. It came out in 2011. A year later, how was the record done in your eyes? Um, it's, it's, it's been a, a, another chapter in, in just songwriting, but I, mean, I haven't changed anything. But, um, it all kind of came out of uh, Walton Mobile to have a Mardi Gras. Uh, and Joe Kane is this figure in, in Mobile who New Orleans you know, knows nothing about. And, 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 and uh, you know, he, res he brought Mardi Gras back to Mobile. It started in Mobile in the United States. It started in France. But um, when I formed a new band, everybody was from South Alabama. And, uh, and just kind of took the name from these guys who stole you know, farm implements and a coal wagon and a mule and marched downtown just playing music and with the Union soldiers going, no, Mardi Gras, but they're like... You can't stop the party, man. Yeah, and, you can't, and that, that was kind of the whole thing, like, keep it, this is the thing, you know. And I have a lot of weird political views according to South Alabama and kind of sneak them in. That's why I call it the Lost Cause Ministries. <laughs> the first song off that album was Coconut Moonshine. You said it's about Mr. Jim from the Shed, Blue, yeah. the shed Barbecue Joint in Ocean Springs, Mississippi. Well, that place burned to the ground. I, I hope Mr. Jim made it out okay. He's How, fine. How's yeah. he doing? He's doing. He's doing great. He lives in a trailer uh, down a dirt road, right close to there. And, uh, you know, he's got his coconut moonshine. They they opened up the next day uh, with their mobile units. And what I heard was when the fire happened around two and it kind of got put out by 4.30, which is when they normally pull the meat out of the, the cooker. Yeah. And they were able to, everything burned down, but this thing's metal, so they were able to feed the fire department off of the <laughs> barbecue. You know, that's 4.30, you know. fire's out, barbecue's done, here we go. And the next day, it's open. You know? That's why that's the most legit barbecue. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So that's cool. We're real bummed that the Destiny one closed down. Yeah, that was pretty much it for around here. But um, we've actually seen you perform at both shed restaurants. But the first time we were lucky enough to see you play was a little bar down on Magazine Street in New Orleans, owned by Pepper Keenan, called Le Bon Tempe. <laughs> uh, 
it seems like there's you know a million of those kinds of venues in NOLA, just small, but they still have a packed house and have that rocking atmosphere. Is there any place in New Orleans that stuck out as your personal favorite to play at? Well, between the Bon Toms, DBA, and uh, Chicky Wawa. Chicky Wawa. Yeah, it just, just started up. And uh, I, mean, I spent years playing you know, the Maple Leaf. I used to work the door at Chicky Tunas. Before, yeah, it was before the House of Blues and before the Howlin' Wolf. And, and that was the place to play. And I had a band called the House Levelers. We used to play there. And, you know, I've got this whole history of New Orleans. That, you know, it's, there's a lot of people there still know about like like Giacomo's you know Giacomo's right mm -hmm. by Maple Leaf I remember Jack had the warehouse cafe on uh, South Peters and he would just be this drunk guy in a Mexican hat stand on the bar and, like, and now he's got the biggest restaurant in New Orleans you know and, and, uh, watching him you know come from there to, you know, to Mr. Giacomo's and, uh, yeah, and then when I play in New Orleans, it's this whole deep connection with it. Some people get it, some don't. It changes. Do you prefer? Do you prefer more of the intimate settings and those kinds of places, or do you like the large-scale crowds and festivals that you play at? Both. I mean, because there's this really intimate connection you get. Feel everybody, and you know if I, I would define God or something, it would be the relationship between two people, or two things. And so music and the audience—it's not the music and it's not the audience, but it's the connection that happens in that sweet spot in between. And it's sometimes easier to feel more intense in a smaller place. Festivals can be intense in, in crowded places for these, it's bigger, because it's like, you know, this whole, you know, thing, but, you know, we could, you know, growing up on the back porch, I think the smaller places probably yeah. Most intense because I know people are connecting to the words. It's not, it's not like this. I'm 10 feet off the you know, ground. And stuff, you know. After uh, Hurricane Katrina, you left New Orleans, obviously, moved up to Nashville, Tennessee. You just recently moved back to Alabama. Was that an easy decision for you to come back? Uh, yeah. You know, it made sense because I have kids. Sure, I got you. Granddaddy and grandma lives out there. And as things get up, to where they're getting older, can't travel so much. It's like, yeah, you know, I'm thinking, what am I doing I'm trying to make my whole stand in this place I know nothing about? You know, I moved to Nashville and went to Katrina when I was 40. And uh, I realized quickly what. My friends were all down on the golf course. And it just made sense. It's raining outside one window and it's not hard. You had a few songs in the movie you mentioned, a love song for Bobby Long, which starred John Travolta and Scarlett Johansson, the hottest girl in the world. <laughs> Especially when she was 19. Yeah, including the title track. Um, you also had a cameo in the film. How was the experience and how are your acting skills any good? My acting skills are great. <laughs> you know, I'm, actually, that's what I want to kind of pursue a little bit. As I'm getting older, I want to stay home. Uh, um, it was uh, it was bittersweet, you know, because at a time when I should have been kind of relishing, and, like, this is a cool thing. I was I just had my daughter, and I'm just broken up with. And mom, I know you're doing that grinding thing. <laughs> yeah. Um, but um, when it was going on, I was doing landscaping. Come here, Hampton. You know, 
because it's this movie with John Travolta, but I got no money coming in. It's all like you're going to get paid. Something. And so I spent several days rehearsing with John Travolta. With these songs, like three days, and you know, the second day in, I come in, I'm all dirty, and I'm fucking been running a jackhammer all day. And he was like, you're, you're cool because you're not really starstruck. You're just, I'm like, man, have you run a jackhammer before? <laughs> and he was like, no. And I was like, you ought to. You ought to. Just you know, pull your finger. You know, it's like, just. So, you know, it, 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 the whole thing came about at a point where I was kind of disgusted. But also. You know, this is, it was very much a part of the whole story, you know, the whole disaster that I thought would never happen in my life was happening at the point where you're talking about Bobby Long and thing. And he was a friend of our family. The whole movie, Hollywood wanted to squelch the fact that it was a real person to cover their ass and stuff. And it was all kind of like this weird thing. I ended up being like, a colleague would, yeah, you know, Satan. And, because you know, they, they needed the love story and the car chase and the titties. It's like, you don't need that. You know? Yeah, lots of them. I got to ask, is there really a place called the Colonial Inn in, uh, yeah, in it's Alabama? Called, yeah, but it, I, it's called the Colonial Manor. Oh, okay. And people, I've just played in Bruton like two weeks ago, and I played there for like homecomings and yeah, stupid yeah, yeah. stuff. But, People, you know, there were like family there, and, 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 and uh, but I couldn't rhyme anything with Colonial Man. Like, you know, it's like a rotten banana. The truth. Because I've looked it up on Google Maps. It's let Colonial me tell Manor you. Hotel, right. and that's where Bobby, you know, stayed. Though, you know, wow. he burned every bridge. And, you know, that all everything from there is true. But like, banana. It was all wrong with man. <laughs> so in slightly wrong with Stan. Yeah. Slightly. <laughs> slightly. I guess. It's better than banner. What do you have with that? Yeah, banana, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you said you had to talk with Mr. DeVolta about the Jack Bear. You had a interaction with them off stage. Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was real super nice. Cool. Just real down to earth, you know, because you know, when we get together for rehearsals and you know, recorded those songs, he's like miming the guitar, I'm playing the guitar. So we're sitting like this, and you know, yeah. we see each other, it's like, how, how is you doing? You know, we're like, yeah, how are you doing? And we hug, you know, it was, it was just real nice guy. Cool, cool. Well, personally, my favorite song that you've done is Mermaid off 2006's Whale and Ride. Uh, it's just a hauntingly beautiful tune that just seems to pour emotion when you're playing it. The solo on that song is just absolutely incredible. What is the inspiration for that song? What is it about? Uh, it's mostly about my dad, who had uh, been going through clinical depression. And at that point, he was, he's doing so much better now. I mean, I think with that movie coming out, it gave him some sense of validation that the fact that he wrote three novels and a million short stories that never got published. He living in South Alabama, having these crazy thoughts. I, I saw him just disappear. And then I was writing a song about him, you know, give me life, give me hope, and strength, and all that. You know, I've seen people with like William Steyer, you know, some of the most brilliant artists in the world have depression. It's devastating, you know, and they say, have hope, you know. Um, so hey, it came from it came from thinking about my hair. Great song. Well, this is our last question, and since we're here back on the Gulf Coast, you know, home of crazy weather, 
crazy animals and sometimes crazy ass people. Sometimes. Just gotta ask, which is the more terrifying way to go out? Sharks or alligators? Ha! Damn. I'll put some thought into this one too. Oh, wow. Chomp, chomp, chomp. Uh, yeah, either way, yeah, yeah. Oh, my better. You got your all right, who's doing the shrimp talk? Just thinking about it. I'll rob the whole interview to a brand new hole. It's probably a shark because I spent so much time swimming in the Gulf. Yeah. That to, for the Gulf to betray me that way, because the Gulf has been my healing waters where I go in. You know, there's a time in, in August where all that phosphorescent, broken up jellyfish, yeah. you can go like this. I mean, I've had sex in the water with this glow, and it's just like, wow, this is so. That would be terrifying and horrifying for the Gulf to betray me. Yeah, in that way. I'm with you. I mean, if I'm in the swamp, in the, I deserve it. Yeah. I don't deserve it if I'm in the Gulf. I feel the same way. All right, well, you can see this interview and more of Grace and Cap's live performance on TyroneHood.tv and 38.com. Thank you.